Uh, okay, we'll get started. This is a nice small group. I appreciate it. If anybody feels brave enough to come down towards the front, um, I don't know if it'll be easier or harder to see the slides with the glare from the back or the front, but um, I know there's a lot of popularity in this slot. You've got the board meeting, the next JS, and the technical debt talk, so thank you for choosing to come to this one. Before I get started, I want to make sure that you are, in fact, in the right room. This is uh, what can we learn from the Drupal Local Development Survey, which is a survey of all Drupal developers worldwide that I conducted earlier this year. Um, I shared the results at the Drupal South Conference in Wellington, New Zealand in May. This will be a variation on that with a closer look at how things appear in Europe versus the rest of the world. Um, so my name is Mike Richardson. I run a Drupal web hosting company in Australia that specializes in mission critical websites. Um, and I also help organize a couple of conferences. I'm the treasurer for the Drupal South Steering Committee in Australia and New Zealand, where we put together the Drupal South event. Um, the next one will be in March in Sydney. I'll have a slide at the end to try and pitch that to you. Um, and the other one that's just being announced at the moment is Drupal Asia which is a new event that's being run in Singapore from July 31st to August 2nd next year. I'll talk a little bit about that later on as well. So, let's get on with it. Um, I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess that everybody who made it into this room has heard of the survey before. Can I ask you to raise your hands if you'd completed it, not this year, but in a previous year? What, two, okay, three, all right, thank you. Um, did you complete it this year? Okay, all right. Um, for those of you who hadn't heard of it and hadn't completed it, I'm really glad that you're here. If you wanna have a chat later on, I'd love to know what drew you into this room versus the other great content that's going on um, and what you hoped to learn from the local dev survey that maybe we didn't cover today. Um, we're starting to think about what we're going to do for next year's survey, the questions we want to ask, so feedback is really, really valuable for us at the moment. So the dev survey was not my initiative, it was started in 2018 by Jeff Geeling and Chris Urban. Um, they are both former Acquia team members but are no longer involved with Drupal. Um, but when I was first starting my company in 2018, the results of the survey was really, really helpful to me in terms of working out what Drupal developers are looking for, particularly from a hosting provider and from a local environment manager, which is a space that we operated in. Um, so I reached out to Chris and Jeff to say, because the survey didn't happen in 2020 or 2021, oh, sorry, in 2021 or 2022, so I reached out to them to say, will you do it again? Because I'd love to see some more up-to-date results. Uh, if not, would you mind if I carried the torch and they generously gave me the all clear to go ahead and start that survey from 2023. But uh, the survey would not be possible without their earlier work, so we really are indebted to them for, for putting that together. Um, Jeff, uh, sorry, I'll just point out quick, quickly, Chris is now um, working on product at a company called Confluent that does a managed Kafka service and Jeff is a very successful full-time YouTuber with over half a million subscribers. Um, you have probably seen some of his work around Ansible on his YouTube channel. He talks a lot about Raspberry Pis, Linux, home networking. Really great channel, so highly recommend checking it out. Um, this year, for the first time, we also translated the survey into three other languages. So we're really indebted to Maureen Gandhi, Jimmy Can from Ironstar, and Chris Wu, for providing translations into French, Japanese, and traditional Chinese directly. And specifically for the, trench tra the French translation, this had a real impact on the number of results that we had. There were, out of something like 60 results from France, uh, 34 or just over half of them came from um, the translation itself that we may not have picked up. Um, so, if you'd like to provide a translation in your own language for the 2024 survey to help us get that reach, then please let me know. It takes about four to six hours of your time to do a translation, um, and there's a bit of a workflow that we've got now that make it a bit easier. All right, so let's get into some of the stats. Uh, can I check, are you guys here for the local dev survey results? Are you here for the local dev survey? Or are you here for this talk, local dev survey? Okay, all right. 
Um, all right, so looking at stats, who responded? We had 829 responses from 96 different countries, from places as far away as Ethiopia, Costa Rica, Vietnam, Cuba, and maybe not so far away, Albania, um, as well as a lot of the countries you'd expect to see. We had a lot of responses from the US. We had quite a few responses from Australia and New Zealand, which was overrepresented, mostly because that's where I am and that's the first area I pushed the, uh, the survey out to. Um, I was really delighted when we made it to the first 100 responses, because for me that was statistically significant. If we could get that many, there was conclusions we could draw from the data. Um, I announced the survey in the evening, went to bed and thought, if I wake up with 10 responses in the morning, I'll be happy. I woke up with 300. Um, so it was a really great response, and it was by and large because of folks like Acquia, the Drupal Association, the developers of Lando and DDEV, um, Pantheon platform and more uh, sharing that survey with their own network and it ended up being consistent with previous years where we get about a thousand results. So 829 from 96 countries is really, really great. Looking at Europe, 369 of those responses came from this region and for the purposes of this presentation, Europe includes Turkey uh, and Switzerland and the UK, Norway and other EEA members. Um, we can see that France won out in terms of overall responses, and again, half of those came through the translation. Um, UK falling just slightly behind, with Spain, Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands trailing off from there. Again, if we had a German translation or a Spanish translation, it would be really interesting to see just how more well represented those regions would be. So if you'd like to provide a translation, um, I, would, I would love to have the help. Um, we also asked uh, respondents, including yourself, how many Drupal developers are in your current company? And this was to gauge the size of the teams that people were working in. And as you can see from these stats, there are still quite a number of Drupal developers, about 17% who are on their own. Um, and there's also quite a large number of Drupal developers, about 20%, who are part of a team of more than just Drupal devs, more than 25 Drupal devs in that team. And I actually made a little bit of a mistake here because in the 20... 20 and earlier surveys, there was a block for 25 to 50 and more than 50. And I, from my very naive perspective, went, well, no one's going to be in a company with more than 50 Drupal devs, surely. Um, and so I took it out and just left it at 25 plus in order to shrink the survey slightly. And that, I think, was a mistake. So next year, we will bring that back. Um, so a very, very widespread, but when you think about some of the QA results that we'll look at later, just remember that more than 20% of Drupal devs are on their own or just with one other person, which impacts that, that, those sort of statistics. Um, probably everyone's favorite area of the results was the local environment manager, Lando versus DDEV versus LAMP versus Homebrew, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we had a lot of really interesting responses there. Most people are using more than one tool. Uh, and if you look globally, you can kind of see a bit of a map here that attempts to demonstrate, and I know that the, this, these colors must be really hard for you to see, so I'll step through it really briefly. In the US, Germany, Italy, Austria, Spain, uh, and Finland, DDEV is the leading solution. DDEV was incredibly popular in the US, and that surprised me a little bit because, as you can probably see in the bottom right-hand corner, um, Australia and New Zealand, Lando is overwhelmingly popular. Um, and I don't know of very many people who use DDEV within Australia. I don't know the reason for that, but most people back home will use Lando. In Australia and New Zealand, 50% of Drupal devs just use Lando. Whereas in Europe, that value drops to about 28%. And solutions, especially in places like France and Poland, um, solutions like custom Docker become more popular. Um, for whatever reason. And again, DDEV looks more popular overall because it's got strong representation in the US. About a quarter of all survey responses came from the US. Um, and custom Docker looks more popular in Europe. So if we look at that comparison between Europe and the rest of the world, you can see that DDEV is about the same. Lando is less popular in Europe than everywhere else. But custom Docker solutions uh, and LAMP, WAMP stacks and Homebrew uh, sorry, custom Docker solutions are more popular in Europe, um, but otherwise, you're sort of, it, it's pretty similar stats. But um, I thought that was interesting. Um, we also had a look at 
if people were thinking of switching from their local environment manager. Now, because a lot of people were using more than one, most people were using more than one, it was a little bit hard in the survey results to say people with DDEV are more likely to switch or people with homebrew are more likely to switch. But overall, regardless of the tool or tools that people were using, the overwhelming majority are sticking it out. They're staying with it, whether or not it's LAMP or WAMP. And there was some freeform sections on, these, on this question where people were quite adamant to point out, I don't want to use Docker or I don't want to have to manage this and, and so on. So there was a lot of um, strong opinions about what people's local environment manager is. Uh, we also had a look at what tools were more popular based on team size. And I think there's an opportunity with stats like this for people in smaller teams to get a bit of insight into what larger teams are doing and using. So again, with this glare, it might be a bit hard to see, but effectively, do-it-yourself, LAMP, WAMP, and so on solutions are more popular with smaller teams. Lando is more popular with smaller teams. DDEV and custom Docker solutions and Doxel tend to be more popular with larger teams. Um, at very large teams, the difference seems to break down, but certainly if you're in a team of three to 10, uh, it would seem that DDEV wins out over Lando, but that might also be because DDEV is more popular in places like the US and Germany, where there just happen to be larger teams. Um, on the topic of Docker, we asked developers if they felt that it was important to understand how to use Docker. 70% of everyone who responded to the survey is using some form of containerized local environment. So the majority of people are using Docker, but the question is, do you need to know how to use Docker to use these tools? Because tools like Lando and DDEV abstract a lot of that away from you. I know a lot of DDEV users and a lot of Lando users who have no idea how Docker operates and when those solutions break, they get stuck because they don't know how to troubleshoot those tools. But otherwise, they're completely happy and they're not interested in getting further into the details with Docker. So 59% of respondents said, yes, it's important to know how to use Docker to be a Drupal dev, um, which again isn't surprising since 70% of them are using Docker in some format. But I did want to see how that answer changed based on the user's experience with Docker. So again, with the glare, this is really hard to interpret, but I'll walk you through it. On the, right, sorry, on the left hand side is the yes group. So this is the group that says, you should know how to use Docker if you want to be a Drupal developer. And on the right hand side is the group who says it doesn't matter. Um, the bars in each group represent the skill level. So most people know how to do basic tasks. Some people know how to do additional tasks. And all the way on the right hand side in green is like running Docker in CI CD environments. So the left hand group is slightly more skilled at everything than the right hand group. So there's an impression there that people who are more comfortable with Docker think it's more important. But generally, there's a lot of people who are comfortable with Docker that don't think you need to know it at all. And again, 70% of people are using Docker, 59% only don't think it's really that important. Um, operating systems and code editors. Uh, there's not a tremendous amount of insight in this, but it's, it's interesting to step through. Um, it's mostly as you'd expect it would be. 56% of users are on Macs. This is global. 29% are on Linux. 15% are on Windows. But if you look at that, those values for Europe, things change quite a bit. Mac drops market share by about 10%, and the difference is almost entirely made up by Linux, um, which is really interesting to see, and it, it, it goes in line with my own expectations just from an economic perspective that there will be parts of Europe where sp shelling out for a, for a high-end MacBook just isn't going to be feasible. Getting something more cost-effective like a Linux laptop or a Windows laptop is more likely. Um, so that's how things sort of look at a high level. Um, and if you drill down a little bit further into the individual operating systems for Windows and Linux especially, you can see that Debian-based Linux is overwhelmingly more popular than any other Linux variety. And Windows 10 still beats out Windows 11 even two years after Windows 11 um, was being used. Can I ask for a really quick show of hands, who here is developing for Drupal on Windows? Yes. Yes. 
yeah. Yes. So the question is, um, how did we classify WSL or Windows subsystem for Linux users? And in the original survey, we didn't. But in the notes that you could have for this question, they did. They absolutely were like, yes, I'm on Windows, but I'm not developing in Windows. I'm developing in Linux on Windows. Um, we didn't get to capture that in this year's result. We will capture it in next year, um, particularly not just for people who are doing development in WSL, but also people who are doing development in a VM that's different. So for example, if they're on a Mac, but they're in a Linux VM, we didn't really get to capture that in this year. Um, we didn't bother to ask what specific version of Mac OS people were running, simply because it didn't seem meaningful. Most people will update their Mac OS version and the difference between Mac OS versions isn't dramatic like it is for something like Windows 10 to Windows 11. Um, we asked folks what IDE or editor they use. This is the global data. Um, so we got a lot of feedback on this question because we only gave an option for one and a majority of people use more than one IDE, which is an oversight because I use more than one IDE. Um, so next year, we will ask people what they're using, but in this year's survey, we're asking people what their primary IDE is. Um, and you can just see that PHP Storm edges out VS Code just a little bit. Um, there isn't a lot of market share left for anybody else. There are some, some people who are still hanging on to Atom and Sublime, and if you look at the Europe values, there are even some people hanging on to Notepad++. Um, which is great, great for them. There's three VS Codium users worldwide. VS Codium is the completely open source version of VS Code. Um, those users, all three of them, are in Europe. Don't know why, but interesting stat. And they're not in the same country, so I don't think they work on the same team. But what you see with the Europe stats is that PHP Storm gets a lot more market share. It grows about 10% market share over VS Code, which I thought was really interesting. I would have thought, going back to those economics of people in parts of Europe aren't going to shell out for a MacBook, I wouldn't have expected that group to be shelling out more for a paid for closed source editor versus something like VS Code, which is free. But those are the stats. Um, looking at this data over the years, again with the glare, blue 2019, top row, Middle row, red, 2020, the last time Jeff and Chris ran the survey, and yellow, 2023, this year's survey, you can kind of see how the market share has shifted over time. So what's very interesting is PHP Storm and VS Code are gaining market share, but not really from each other. They're gaining it from the Sublime and the Notepad and the Vim and everybody else. So those tools are falling in popularity. Um, there's still you know, one person on BB Edit and one person on NetBeans. Um, but overwhelmingly, PHP Storm and VS Code have consolidated the market. Um, and again, it's really interesting to see that the, the paid for tool for PHP Storm is still in use. Um, I want to do another quick raise of hands. Who here is on PHP Storm? Okay. Who here is on VS Code? It's, it's that. That's basically the way it worked out. Do you have a question? Sorry, what's that? Eclipse. Eclipse? Oh, sorry. Um, uh, Eclipse, not captured. Wouldn't, it wouldn't have been enough, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, sorry about the microphone. Moving on, quality assurance. Um, so we asked which quality assurance controls were in place, keeping most of the same answers that were in the 2020 and earlier surveys. So this is the percentage of respondents who use a particular QA control. So for example, 65% of respondents are using peer code reviews. If that seems low, just bear in mind that 17% of respondents don't have a peer to code review. Um, and as we move down, 16% of people are still doing nothing. Um, there were even some people in the results that are saying things like, um, you know, I'm still making my changes live in production. Um, and there's no, there's no local development environment. Um, if you compare this data to the rest of the world, the results are pretty much the same. Um, so sorry, this is Europe before was global, 63% versus 65, 60 versus 58. Um, so it's roughly the same. 
there isn't a tremendous amount of, there's no gotcha moment here where it's like, ah, Europe's different to the rest of the world. From a QA perspective, Europe's pretty much the same, but that changes. Um, we ask people about their future with Drupal, specifically uh, whether or not they thought they'd still be using Drupal in 12 months. I know this is a Drupal con, you're probably all embedded within Drupal and planning to stick with it, I hope. But as a show of hands, is there anyone in the room who, I won't call on you, so don't freak out. Is there anyone in the room who doesn't think they'll be working with Drupal in 12 months? <laughs> Akil, keep your hand down. Now, all right, so you're all going to keep working with Drupal in 12 months, but you're not representative of the wider community. Globally and in Europe, uh, about 2% say they won't be working with Drupal in, in a year's time, 13% say maybe, so 15% overall. Again, it's the Drupal development survey, you would expect it to have a pretty strong bend in that direction, and if people weren't expecting they'd be working with Drupal in, in 12 months, they probably wouldn't have answered the survey. But it will be really interesting to see how that data changes over time. Um, what was next? My favorite topic, hosting and security. Um, so we asked respondents who they use to host their production websites, and we got a tremendous amount of answers. Most respondents, and I'm talking like 85, 90%, are using more than one hosting provider. Um, so we collected a lot of data for this question, and globally there were 81 different hosting companies that were mentioned. Um, about two thirds of those only had a single respondent who was using them, and they tended to be uh, local companies that were specific to a particular country. Uh, so for example, um, Crystal in the UK, Gundy here in France, Ironstar in Australia, um, there were a few of those, Sakura Cloud in Japan. Um, but looking at this data, red top line is the global market share, blue lower line is the share in Europe. And you sort of see that AWS, pretty much the same, um, Acquia, uh, drops from 18% globally to 13% in Europe. Same thing with Pantheon. Both Acquia and Pantheon are less widely used in Europe, whereas platform is pretty much the same. Tools like Azure, DigitalOcean, Linode, and Google Cloud, more heavily used in Europe. Um, we've also included what I believe are Europe-specific providers, Hetzner and OVH, in those stats as well. Um, the reason they probably look really similar is because for the global stats, the Europe data is included in that cohort. Um, so that's sort of how the hosting provider usage looks. And the other really interesting insight in this is how usage of a hosting provider changes based on team size. So what you're looking at here on the left hand side is individual developers and teams of increasing size over to the teams with more than 25 Drupal devs in the team. And what you will see is larger teams are more likely to use a platform as a service provider like Acquia or Pantheon or Platform. Um, I think there's an expectation that a larger team with more budget and more skills is going to host it themselves, but in reality, those teams are more likely to want to let somebody else host it. So if you've got a decent sized or mission critical website, this isn't a pitch, it's gonna sound like a pitch, but it's not. If you've got a mission critical website and you're self hosting it, have a think about the fact that the people with the larger sites don't want to do that. Uh, so, I'm just gonna let that gentleman take his photo. All right, cool. Um, the slides are available, by the way, um, if anybody needs them afterwards. Um, and the full data set is available as well. If you wanna have a look and crunch your own numbers, you can get access to the Google Sheet too. Um, so yeah, larger Drupal teams prefer PaaS providers rather than doing it themselves. Um, we asked respondents which security controls they were using to protect their sites, and this is one of those areas where Europe just did not reflect the global trend at all. And to be honest, not in a fantastic way. Um, there were about 143 people or 17% of respondents who just didn't answer this question. This is part of a survey drop off where this is one of the last questions on the survey so everyone's getting a bit tired. But also there were a lot of people who took the time to fill out the survey and just say, I don't know. It's the IT team, it's the clients team. Somebody else is responsible for this. Um, but if you have a look, Tools like having some form of two-factor authentication or SSO authentication for Drupal goes from 44% globally to less than a third within Europe. Uh, and, and to me, I'm, I'm concerned by that 
Um, if I could, if there was one thing I think you could do to protect your Drupal site, it's probably to patch it. But the second thing is two-factor authentication or SSO. Um, so those are really poorly represented within Europe, and I hope in years to come that can change. I did a talk in Prague last year that was aimed at uh, non-technical decision makers and trying to equip them with the questions they could take to their team to sort of say, you know, what are we doing in this regard? And it was kind of pitched as a, as a training session for people who are responsible for Drupal security but don't know anything about Drupal security. Um, so if you want to get a link to that, let me know afterwards. Um, uh, next year, we will expand this question to ask about more advanced controls like workstation security. A lot of really big headline attacks that are happening at the moment are all through compromised workstations, LastPass, Okta, CircleCI, all got bitten through attacks like that. Um, so that's that, and that's the bulk of the survey results, which we got through much faster than I did in my rehearsal, so let me talk to you about Drupal South. So, um, Sydney, beautiful part of the world, March, the best weather that you will get. Um, the call for papers uh, just opened for Sydney this morning. So if you want to come down and have a chat to a bunch of Aussies and Kiwis about Drupal, please um, go and put that talk in. We also do uh, Splash Awards, which is a fantastic um, event that we've copied from Europe where we all get dressed up and we hand out an award for the best Drupal sites. Some winners in the room from last year's event. Um, and uh, there's a really great one-day contribution workshop that's generally run by the, the very talented guys at Previous Next. So drupalsouth.org forward slash Sydney. And in July, the just recently announced Drupal Asia in Singapore. Um, this is a two-part thing. Part of it is an event to get India, Japan, Philippines, Vietnam, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, all into one conference where we can all share ideas and innovation and um, perspectives, but also to establish a Drupal Asia steering committee that will be an elected body from the region that will be responsible for uh, running these events in the future and, and building that community over time. Um, so, thank you. You all get out a few minutes early. Um, feel free to on the left, rate this, the conference. On the right, rate me. And um, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Do you want to? Sorry. Do you want to come up to the microphone? Were there any on the up? Thank you. So thank you for your, uh, putting together this survey, as, uh, as well as sharing the results with us. Um, going forward, do you have any plans to look at the results over years compared to what was done before? And going in the future to spot trends. Like, I'd be interested to see, like, you know, stupid little things like this VS code, how does that look versus, like, three years ago versus today? Yeah. The, the stat before um, that was comparing, where was it? Yeah, so comparing, say, VS code down the bottom there versus 2020, 2019, I didn't have access to the, to the raw data um, for, to the spreadsheets for that, so I'm going... I've plugged all of that in manually based on the previous YouTube videos, but definitely for 2024, 2025, and so on, there'll be a big component of tracking stuff over time. And also, you've got to kind of, it's really hard to balance not asking too many questions, but not getting enough data. There were questions we asked like, um, are people doing any headless work? And I think the, the response was like 60% of people had built a headless site in the past year. Um, and there's follow-up questions we want to ask from that now, which is, how did you do it? What tool did you use? Would you do it again? Um, which I find is the most prevalent question when it comes to headless is, you know, would you do it again? Um, so we definitely want to ask questions like that and compare them year over year. Um, now we've got the full data set for next year, and that's open and anyone can access it. We can do the same thing for next year and regional groups can do it as well. Like if someone in South America wants to run their own survey for their community, they can do that and they compare it globally like I just have done. Thanks. Anybody else? Cool. Class dismissed. Thank you.